Hello viewers, this is Dr. P. Mary Anupama from the Department of Biochemistry, St. Joseph's College for Women, Vishakhapatnam. Today, we will be studying the topic, Introduction to Enzymes. Contents that we will be studying include Introduction to Enzymes, Definitions of Isoenzymes, Epoenzymes, Coenzymes and Cofactors and then Fundamentals of Enzyme Essay. Introduction to Enzymes Enzymes are also termed as biocatalyst. What is a catalyst? A catalyst is a chemical substance that increases the rate of any chemical reaction without itself undergoing any change. So in the same way enzymes these are biocatalysts which increase the rate of biochemical reactions within our cells. The enzymes they combine with the substrates to form enzyme substrate complex and this enzyme substrate complex lead to conversion of the substrate into product which dissociates. So we see that the enzyme is recovered at the end of the reaction. One more important feature of this catalytic based reactions is that they decrease the activation energy. Activation energy which is required for the substrate to get converted into product or for two substrates to combine and give rise to a product. So in this we can see that A and B are the substrates which in the absence of any enzyme they require lots of energy that is used and finally you get the product. While in the presence of enzyme the amount of energy that is used for the conversion of or for the combination of A and B to AB is quite less. So this is how enzymes they reduce the activation energy which is required for product formation. Protein nature of enzymes. Enzymes are synthesized within the cells and they perform all the biochemical reactions. They are mostly protein in nature except for ribozyme and they are very much specific in their action. History and background of enzymes. In the year 1878, Poon has first coined the term enzyme which in Greek means in the east. Buchner in the year 1883, he has isolated enzymes from the cell-free extract of the yeast and then he named it as zymase. In the year 1926, James Sumner, he is the person to first isolate and crystallize urease from jack bean and he identified it as a protein. And here the process of enzyme isolation from then it started. Many thousands of enzymes have been identified, they were purified and today we have them in their purest form. You have several sources of enzymes like you have animals, plants and even microbial sources from which enzymes are purified. Chemical nature of enzyme. We know that enzymes are proteins except for ribozyme all the rest of the enzymes are proteins. And here these enzymes they have a primary structure which is the sequence of amino acids which have a secondary structure having alpha and beta, alpha helices and beta sheets and then a tertiary structure. This tertiary structure it gives the conformation to the enzymes that is responsible mainly for their activity. So during the folding of this particular enzyme it will lead to the formation of a pocket which is called as the active site. And this is the site where conversion of the substrate to the product takes place. Now what is holoenzyme? Holoenzyme, it is the basic functional unit of the enzyme and you call it as the holoenzyme. And the holoenzyme consists of two components. It has an epoenzyme and a coenzyme. Epoenzyme is the protein part of the enzyme while coenzyme it is the non-protein part. Together the epoenzyme and coenzyme they form the holoenzyme. What is a prosthetic group? It is a non-protein part that is covalently bound to the enzyme. You can see here this is the enzyme having a three dimensional conformation having the active site and here you have covalently bound prosthetic group. Generally we see that the coenzymes they can be separated by dialysis while these prosthetic groups they cannot be separated from the epoenzyme by dialysis. Isoenzymes. These are enzymes which have different amino acid composition but still they catalyze the same reaction. So here we are trying to depict that there is a reaction X which is catalyzed by isoenzymes, isoenzyme 1, 2 and 3. They are catalyzing the same reaction. 
and here the variation is they vary with respect to their kinetic parameters with respect to their localization and they are coded by homologous genes let us see some examples of isoenzymes first one is lactate dehydrogenase lactate dehydrogenase it catalyzes the conversion of pyruvate to lactate and it is a tetramer the molecular weight of lactate dehydrogenase is 140000 daltons and it comprises of two subunits we call them as the m form and the h form h form and m form these two forms they are labeled according to their localization m form is present in the skeletal muscles while h form is present in the heart a combination of these two subunits result in the formation of the five isoenzymes so here we have h4 which is ldh1 h3 m1 which is ldh2 h2 m2 is ldh3 h1 and m3 is ldh4 and m4 is ldh5 ldh that is lactate dehydrogenase it is required for the conversion of pyruvate to lactate mainly under anaerobic conditions the second example is creatine phosphokinase this creatine phosphokinase it has three isoforms cpk1 cpk2 and cpk3 so each isoenzyme it is a dimer which consists of two subunits the b subunit and the m subunit b indicating brain and m indicating the muscle so this cpk1 it has two b subunits and it is seen in the brain while cpk2 is a combination of b subunit and m subunit which is found in the heart while cpk3 is a combination of two m subunits which is seen in the skeletal muscles the third example is alkaline phosphatase as such alkaline phosphatase it consists of six isoforms ranging from alpha 1 alpha 2 to pre beta 1 beta 2 and so on and so forth each of which has clinical significance here alpha 2 alp it if its level is increased in the serum it indicates hepatitis by pre beta 2 alp that is alkaline phosphatase it indicates bone diseases let us see in detail about epoenzyme and holoenzyme so epoenzymes these are the inactive forms of the enzymes and if they are to become active they require binding of some or the other cofactor which can be an organic or an inorganic molecule and now holoenzyme is the active form of this epoenzyme it has cofactors attached with it we have non covalent cofactors as well as covalent ones and covalent ones we call them as prosthetic groups generally vitamins are the prosthetic groups which are covalently bound to epoenzyme giving rise to a holo enzyme examples of epoenzyme the best example is dna polymerase dna polymerase it requires magnesium ions for its activity if any chelating agents are added then replication of dna is stopped because these chelating agents they remove the magnesium ions making the enzyme inactive the second example is rna polymerase rna polymerase we know that it is required for the synthesis of rna molecules from the dna templates and here this epo enzyme it also requires magnesium ions and even zinc ions for its activity let us see about cofactors and coenzymes cofactors as such these are inorganic molecules by coenzymes they are organic molecules so these inorganic molecules they are also required by the epoenzyme for its activity and examples include we have magnesium ions zinc ions manganese cobalt and copper which act as cofactors for epoenzymes coming to coenzymes these are covalently bound organic molecules and examples include vitamins and their derivatives and these are required even for transfer of groups functional groups and even transfer of electrons and so on examples for coenzymes first one is nicotinamide nucleotide nad plus and nadp plus forms we know that these are the derivatives of niacin and they are mostly involved in oxidation reduction reactions 
so here we have reduction of ned plus which is giving rise to nadh and even we have nadp which is reduced to nadph so this is the reduction reaction while this is the oxidation reaction of ned plus some more examples of coenzymes first one is coenzyme a coenzyme a it's a derivative of vitamin b5 and we generally call it as acetyl coa this is acetyl coa it is required for fatty acid synthesis and we also see that it is the starting component in citric acid cycle another example is atp and atp is a non vitamin source it's a purine derivative and the energy that is released during the breakage of bond in the atp that is the phosphodiester bond when it is broken energy is released and that energy it is used for enzymatic conversions fundamentals of enzyme assay why we have to assay the enzyme enzyme assay is done for the following reasons by purifying the enzyme you should know the concentration of the enzyme then you have to check the purity of the enzyme and the full purity so the reasons are listed below to determine the concentration of the enzyme we do it to check the purity during purification process and even the full purification how much at each step it is getting purified and all we have to check that for these reasons we do enzyme assay during the purification of enzymes the following steps are followed first thing is they identify the richest source of enzyme once this is identified it can be a microbial source plant source or animal source then the tissue is taken and the cells are lysed that is lysis of the source once you get the lysate it is it is a very crude one and it is to be stored at 4 degrees centigrade because enzymes they get easily denatured they are thermolabile and then this crude extract it is stored and again checked for enzyme activity during an enzyme assay the following key points are to be followed first thing is the enzymes are very much specific with respect to their substrate so one has to choose an appropriate substrate then maintain the optimal conditions which include the ph temperature usage of appropriate buffer to get that ph presence of cofactors and so on and so forth then identification of suitable quantitative method one can use quantitative methods like titrometric method calorimetric method spectrophotometry can be used then among that one has to choose the best assay procedure which suits their environment and then while suggesting an assay procedure you have to check for its universal adaptability and finally that is a procedure it should be so apt that it can be used for clinical assays also where we have limited availability of enzymes one example that we'll be studying is determination of activity of salivary amylase using dinitrosalicylic acid method in this assay starch is prepared using a suitable buffer salivary amylase is taken it is diluted and added to the starch incubated at 37 degrees centigrade so that starch is hydrolyzed and this will result in reducing sugars formation these reducing sugars these are subjected to estimation by using dinitrosalicylic acid this reagent as such it is reddish orange in color or yellow orange in color upon reaction with glucose it will lead to the formation of 3 amino 5 nitro salicylic acid which is dark reddish brown in color and glucose is converted to gluconic acid so the color intensity of this reddish brown color indicates the amount of reducing sugars which are formed the more the enzyme the more the reducing sugars are formed the more will be the color this is one of the simplest assay procedure which is adapted universally there are many other assay procedures which are available for us 
like we have alkaline phosphate is estimation by para nitrophenol phosphate method we have assay of lipases using para nitrophenol we have protease assays where casein is used as the substrate and the release amino acids there is assay now we have glucose isomerase assay which is also a calorimetric method all these assay procedures these are universally adopted and they are very well established thank you